Education. Well, today is Bethany Sunday. The question is, what does that mean? Well, Bethany, I love Bethany. I love Bethany. Over 20 years ago, I pulled into the parking lot here when no one was here. I knew the church was without a pastor, and I prayed in the parking lot that God would make me the pastor of Bethany Church. And I did that several times, but you called somebody else. <laughs> but God did not forget my prayer because, you know, six years ago last Sunday was my first Sunday as your pastor here. I'm now into my seventh year, all right? <clears throat> I love Bethany and uh, my wife we, together. We love this church. We, we pour our life into uh, this church. And by church, I mean congregation. It's not just the building. It's not just the building. It's you, you the people. But uh, Bethany is a place in the Bible. Uh, it's not a really important place. It's rather an insignificant place. Uh, there were no kings that, that came from Bethany. Uh, there were no great battles fought at Bethany. It's really just like, uh, it's the 7-Eleven just outside of Jerusalem that travelers going to Jerusalem would stop and get their last minute items before they went up over Mount of Olives and down into the Kidron Valley and up to the Golden Gates to enter into the temple. And some of you have your Bethany coffees, like a 7-Eleven coffee. <laughs> you got it this morning. <laughs> you got it this morning. It, it's just a place. In fact, this place, uh, I'm going to first note on there, that's, that's the temple. And just two miles east of Jerusalem is Bethany. It's actually on the hills of the Mount of Olives. And in order to go up to Jerusalem from the east, you would have gone two miles, or thereabouts, that's what the Bible says, to, to Jerusalem, to the city. It's really not the big mega place like Jerusalem. It's a little hamlet, a little village, just a little small place. Now, I want to talk to you about the who's who of Bethany. The who's who of Bethany are not like the who's who of Jerusalem, believe me. There's no governors, there's no priests, there's no high priests. It's just common, ordinary people. But I can identify at least a few of them. The first one I can identify is Simon the leper. Just your na his name tells you enough about this guy. You want to avoid him at all costs, right? <laughs> Uh, leprosy was like the cancer of the day, only it was highly contagious. And so you didn't want to do anything with Simon. He lived there. Then there's Martha. Martha is a woman who's a real doer. She, she's always doing. She's, she's an action woman. She's not the upfront talking, speaking. Now, she's not the one who just sits around and contemplates. No, that would be her sister Mary. Mary is the contemplative one. She's the one who's doing her devotions and making sure she's got, you know, she's into her, 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 her period of prayer. But, but her sister's just the opposite. It's a quick prayer and then it's on with the task. And so there are two kind of different sisters. And, and then there's their brother Lazarus. He's a sickly man, but that's not the main characteristic. Lazarus is a man that Jesus calls his friend that he loved. Wow, I like that. I like that. These are the who's who. That's it. I don't know of anybody else. The Bible talks about that. It's in Bethany. That's it. It's not the place, and it's not the who's who that makes Bethany have any significance. It's the events that take place at Bethany. Bethany is a place where Martha and Mary find their brother is sick. He's really bad at this point. So the sister sent word to Jesus and said, Lord, the one you love is sick. <laughs> He's sick. 
And so he tells the disciples, okay, Lazarus is sick. And uh, so I'm sure they prayed for him. And then uh, a little later he says, yeah, Lazarus ha- is, is sleeping. <laughs> and they say to him, well, if he's asleep, he'll wake up. And then finally he just says it plain outright. He says, Lazarus is dead. You see, when it comes to a believer, the sting of death is gone. It's gone. It's like falling asleep and waking up in heaven. Isn't that great? So he says, hey, our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but, but then he says, spoke plainly to him, Lazarus died. And so now he says, let's go visit him. And uh, so they're going to go up for the funeral, uh, but it's a three to four day journey. And so when they finally get to where Bethany is at that time, uh, he's been dead for four days. But they hear that he's coming. And soon as Martha hears that Jesus is coming, she runs out to meet him and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only. We've all played that little game, haven't we? If only this had happened and this would not happen. If only, if only. Lord, if only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. He said, well, Lazarus is going to live again. And she says, I know he's going to live again in the resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me shall never die. And he that lives and, and, and dies uh, shall live again. Okay, I got that verse a little mixed up, but you, you know what I'm saying. He's saying, hey, if you believe in me, you'll never die. Because even though you die, you're going to be resurrected. But if you're alive while the resurrection takes place, then you never die. And so what he's saying is, the resurrection is coming, and I'm the resurrection. I can give life. And so then she scampers back, and as she scampers back, out runs her sister Mary now. She's done contemplating and, you know, all of that, that Jesus is coming, and she rushes out to see Jesus, and she says the exact same thing as her sister. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. He would not have died. And so he says, ask how, how, how long it has been. It's been four days. And on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. The text tells us, Jesus says, where have you laid him? And then they said, well, come and see, Lord, they replied. And as Jesus goes and he sees, and he sees the crowd there of mourners and, and weeping and all that's going on, You know, everybody knows this verse, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Now we know Jesus knows that he's going to raise him from the dead. But he is a man with with, with such heart of compassion and empathy and sympathy that he sees those mourning and crying over the lost one and he shares that with them in that human moment And he too weeps and cries, and nothing has changed. Jesus still knows the burden on your heart. He still knows. It's at this point that Jesus says, take away the stone. And so they did. They removed the stone. And then Jesus says, in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out all bound. Wrapped up. Now, I've told this story here umpteen times because it's the big event that took place at Bethany. You know Bethany for the fact that God does mighty things at Bethany. Amen? Amen. This church didn't select that name by accident. This church selected that name because there was expectation that God would do great things at Bethany. I believe God is going to do great things at Bethany, that our glory days are not behind us. Now, the second event is probably out of order, but I put it here because it's going to pop up chronologically in order uh, in the Bible. As the next event is Simon, I think, was healed at Bethany. Can't say for sure because the text doesn't tell us that he was healed at Bethany. But it says, in Matthew's account of what is going on after Lazarus was dead at Bethany, it tells us while Jesus was in Bethany, 
in the home of a man known as Simon the leper. <laughs> there it is again. You don't find Simon's name here without that little tagline behind it, the leper. In fact, if you go to Mark, it says, while he was at Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of the man known as Simon the leper. Now here's the deal. According to the book of Leviticus, if you came down with leprosy, okay, like leprosy was like cancer of the day, only thing is it was so highly contagious. He says, as long as they have the disease of leprosy, they remain unclean, they must live alone, and they must live outside the camp. You can't live with other people. You would go into a, a, a leprosy colony, you would hang out with all the other people who had leprosy, they were quarantined with other lepers, okay, and until it was healed. Now, it wasn't healed very often, believe me. It wasn't healed very often. So something happened to this man, Simon. I believe, reading between all the lines, it's not in the text, that Jesus sometime previously had actually healed Simon. And he is still called Simon the leper, even though he no longer has leprosy because Simon was a very common name. Remember, there's Simon Peter. There's a bunch of Simons. And so his, his tag is that he is Simon the leper. You know what my tag is? Dennis the menace. <laughs> I no longer menace people. Like he no longer gave leprosy to people. Well, yeah, I know the first part of that is probably debatable, but, but he no longer has leprosy because he now owns a home, and not only is he in his home, but he has invited guests to his home. And inviting guests to his home, it says, he no longer has leprosy, so it says, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany. Okay, six days before the Passover, all right, so it's uh, Saturday before the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. So that would be like just two weeks ago, if it were our time. So, okay. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, and Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. It was Simon the leper who was giving the dinner and he invites all these guests. And guess what? Guess where Martha is? Martha is in the kitchen getting things ready. <laughs> and guess where Mary is? Mary is at the feet of Jesus. One is the doer. And the one is the one I'm just, I, I, I can't get enough of my Jesus. Mary took a, a pint of pure nard. An expensive perfume, and she poured it on the feet of Jesus, and she wiped it with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And uh, Judas chimes in, and Judas says, Why didn't she sell this and give the money to the poor? Of course, the poor you have with you always, Jesus will respond. But she is doing this in preparation for my burial. Light should have gone on. She's already preparing them for burial. Jesus must be dying and dying soon. Right over their heads. Right over their heads. Right over their heads. Bethany becomes the headquarters for Jesus' ministry. Oh, that's my heart's desire for Bethany, the church. That we are the headquarters for what God is doing in our community through us, the people, just common, ordinary people in Bethany of Waterford. Each evening during that Passover week, each evening, Jesus would go out of Jerusalem and he would go over Mount of Olives, down to the hillside, uh, Mount of Olives, to the place called Bethany. And that became his headquarters. It was his headquarters from which he entered Jerusalem in the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. It was his headquarters for the next day on Monday where he cursed the fig tree. 
It was his headquarters on Tuesday and Wednesday when he entered into Jerusalem. It was his headquarters on Thursday when, from which he went to celebrate the Passover. It was there when he was celebrating the Passover in Jerusalem, the last time that he'd ever left Bethany, he dies after that because after the Passover, he goes through his trials. After those illegal trials, they send him to the cross. And from the cross, he goes to the grave. And from the grave, he arises from the dead. He is alive. He is seen for 40 days after that alive. We went over some of those last week. Went over five of the appearances of Christ, and there were nine altogether that are recorded in the Bible. But over a period of 40 days, it says, He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. It's on the 40th day. And guess where he goes? When he had led them through the vicinity of Bethany. That's where he led them out of Jerusalem to the vicinity of Bethany. That says vicinity. Doesn't mean he went into town. He didn't go in to have a dinner. No, no. He was approaching Bethany and he was on the Mount of Olives on the slope that's going down to this little village hamlet, that 7 Eleven, where everybody stopped to get something before Jerusalem. And he stops there and something huge takes place. It says, He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Jesus leaves earth for heaven just outside Bethany. It'd be like going out in the parking lot, okay? And then Jesus leaves. And everybody's standing around and two angels appear and said, what are you doing looking up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up from you will come back in the same way that you have seen him go. And according to the book of Zechariah in the 14th chapter, on that day when Christ returns, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. He's coming back, guess where? To the vicinity of Bethany. The vicinity of Bethany. Wow, this is a great gospel story. So what's the big deal about this little place, Bethany? <laughs> what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. Little is much when God is in it. Would you say that with me? Little is much when God is in it. Anybody ever heard that line before? Song, the Gaithers, yes. And if I had a voice and had rhythm, I would sing it for you today. <laughs> But little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Little is much when God is in it. Listen, I want you to think of, of Gideon. Remember Gideon? Gideon was the coward judge. He's out. He's actually uh, winnowing and, and doing his wheat in a wine press because he's hiding from the Midianites. And a man comes along and sits down, and he doesn't know it, but the man is God himself. It's the Lord. And the man says, hey there, mighty man of valor. <laughs> he says, what? Who are you talking about? Is there somebody else around here? <laughs> and, and God is calling him to a task. But he protests. He says, wait a minute. If the Lord's with me as a mighty man of valor, he said, where are all the miracles that he used to do? I don't see any of them. And he protests that uh, I am the least, I'm from the, the, the smallest tribe in Israel, and, and my family's the least. I, I'm nobody. I'm insignificant. What can I do? And then the Lord, uh, a couple of chapters later, tells him to blow the trumpet. He blows the trumpet, and there's rally to him. 32,000 men to fight against 135,000 Midianites who have come and attacking them. He's been so afraid of Midianites, he's hiding, and now he's the leader, and he's got this army of 22,000 men, and uh, <clears throat> he's ready to go to battle, but God says to him, hey, Gideon, you got too many. What? He says, tell anybody who's afraid, just go home. 
So if it's 32,000, 22,000 leave. So now he's got 10,000 up against 135,000. And he's feeling like, okay, whatever you say, Lord, but uh, you realize there's 135,000 of them out there? (laughs) And then God says a little later, uh, there are still too many, too many. So he says, hey, take them down to the water, and everyone that dips their head in to get a drink, push them aside. But everyone that laughs like a dog, he reaches down, pulls it up, and drinks it, and, you know, he's on his knees rather than face down in the water. He said, you keep them, let the rest go. And so what does he do? All but 300 got down on their face and drank the water. He's left with 300. Now you get this? 135,000 Midianites to 300 Israelites. Not really good odds. In fact, if you boil that down, it's 450 men men to one. So when I'm going to go into battle, i got to kill 140, 50 men for us to have a victory here. Not likely. Gideon devises a plan. I'm sure it came from the Lord. He says, you divide your 300 into three groups of 100. 100 here, 100 there, 100 there. You give every one of them a trumpet. You give every one of them a torch. You give every one of them a pitcher. And this is what you're going to do. You light the torch. Make sure it's the pitcher's over it. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take, and you're going to take that off. After you've surrounded the whole camp, you're going to take that off you're going to see the light, you're going to blow the trumpet, and you're going to yell for the, for the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And, that, and they're speaking Hebrew, and the Midianites are speaking, speaking Midianite language. And so all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, they do that. And so they look around the whole camp, and they see all these torches, and they're thinking, the enemy is thinking, the Midianites are thinking, there's got to be like a hundred or more for every torch. Those are the leaders in the group, and they hear the, all the noise and the shout and the cry, and they get up, and this is what they do. Then the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. And they killed each other. And the ones that remained, they fled. And then the 300 chased those down really easily, and they had a great battle. Listen to me. Little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. I want you to think of David for a moment. Kind of getting the picture here. This is my storytelling Sunday. <laughs> David uh, went to visit his brothers who were lined up in battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines had this champion by the name of Goliath. He was from Gath. He was one of some five brothers that were all giants. Uh, they were Rephaim. And uh, he, he stood nine feet tall, actually over that. And uh, he had a shield that was huge. It took one man just to carry his shield. And he's, he's just a giant. And then the Bible says, none of the men of Israel would go out and pal- take up the challenge. You see, every day, for 40 days, this giant came out and defied the Israelites to send them out a man and just one-on-one. And, and we'll fight and settle this dispute. And, and everybody in the Israeli army was afraid. And here's and David shows up on the scene and says, what's going on here? Who's going to go out and fight that man? And what will be given to the, the, the man that, that goes out and fights him? And they look at him and says, uh, you're only a boy. <laughs> Nobody volunteered to go out and fight David. said, listen, I fought a lion. I fought a bear. I can go out and fight this guy. He said, I'll do it in the name of the Lord. And so Saul, who is the tallest man in the Israeli army, gives David his equipment. Now, can you see that? Can you see, you know, the greaves on the legs going up to his waist? I mean, can you get this picture? Can, can you see his sword dragging on the ground? All right, all right. And he finally says, I, I, I'm not accustomed to this stuff. Take it off. He takes it all off and he, he grabs his little sling. And, and, and you know what the story is. We have this giant versus this little midget, little boy, what? But little is much when God is in it. We see that the giant came out with bronze helmet, a coat of scale of armor, and on his legs he had the bronze greaves, and the, he had a bronze javelin, and he had the, the, had the armor bearer carrying his shield, and he goes out and he looks at, at David and he says, what is this? You sent out, he said, am I a dog? You sent out a boy with a stick? 
And then he defies him in the name of the Philistine God. And David says, in the name of the, uh, in the, name of the Lord, I come. And he says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take off your head. And he does it. He takes a sling and a stone, and he winds up, and he smacks him right in the forehead. And he just drops. Boom. I'm going to sidetrack just for a moment. This wasn't in my notes. It just popped in my head. Years ago, I was doing a chalk drawing at a Christian camp. And I was doing the drawing of David and Goliath. And so I drew the big, tall figure. And everybody thought that was Goliath, but that was David. Then I drew Goliath laying on the ground. And the last thing I drew was a picture of Goliath's head in David's hand. When the boys figured out what I was doing, they went, they're cheering, yay, because they're all, you know, third graders. Yay, yay. And when the girls figured out what I did, they're going, ooh. (laughs) With a stone, he killed the giant. I don't know what giant is in your life. It's insurmountable, it seems. It just won't go away. It could be health. It could be finances. It could be relationships. It could be anything. It could be the thing that you stood up to pray for earlier today. And you feel like, what can I do? You pray. What? It's such a small little thing. You pray. You see, it was full armor against a stone, and the stone won because little is much when God is in it. Wow. I want you to think of Elijah. Elijah uh, was a true prophet of God, but Ahab and Jezebel, they had their own prophets of Baal and Asherah. Baal was a male dominant god in the Canaanite pantheon, and then Asherah uh, was, uh, also went by the name of Anat and Ashtoreth and several other names, but she was his consort, and, and they were worshiping their idols. Idol of uh, Baal, I've put it up several times, it's a stone idol, and, and then uh, the pole, it was a pole, like a totem pole uh, for Asherah, and, and they would put these up and worship before them, and, and Elijah challenges them, go get your 450 prophets of Baal and your 400 prophets of Asherah and meet me on Mount Carmel and we'll have a showdown, 850 to 1. Not really good odds. And they agree to it. And so the 850 prophets come and and Elijah says, build yourself an altar and I'll build an altar. You put your sacrifice on it and I'll put the sacrifice on mine. And, And he said, and then you pray. It says they started at morning and at noon. Elijah interrupts and says, you need to pray a little louder. I think he's sleeping. (laughs) Maybe if you prayed a little louder, he could be on a trip. You got to get louder so he could hear you. And he's kind of mocking him. And then, then years ago, I studied the Canaanite language and, and there was a group in the Canaanite language. It was a guild. They were called the Slashers. And the slashers were a group of the priests that would then cut themselves to appease Baal. They would cut themselves, put cuts on their bodies. And, and, and the text says, and he, in 1 Kings, it talks about they were cutting themselves, trying to appease Baal. It is now evening, about the time of the evening sacrifice, and he said, listen, you've had your turn, my turn. And so he says, we've got to gather 12, 12 stones. They took 12 stones and They can't be cut because uh, uh, it was a law of the Lord that you didn't use cut stones. You had to use just rough rocks. You put them on, and 12, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And and then he he took the the wood and he put on it, and and he got the sacrifice all ready. And then he said, whoa, I want, he dug a trench around the the, the base of it. A trench? What's this? They're looking at him. What kind of weird religion is this? Nobody puts a trench around. He said, I want you to douse it down so they pour water all over it and it's all wet. He said, Not good enough. Do it again. They do it again. They poured all this water on top of it. And and he says, do it again. And and they pour water all on it. And then he prays. You see, the thing was, you can't light the sacrifice. You got to have your God do it. I think he stood back when he prayed. Because he knew what was coming next. He prayed, God, 
and fire came down and smote that thing. It, it, it burned up the sacrifice, the wood. Uh, it charred the, the stones. It licked up all the water that was in the base of it. This is what he said just before all this happened. How long do you halt between two opinions? I better put it up there. How long do you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And they didn't answer a word. And then all these priests did their routine. And then Elijah prayed. And God sent down fire from heaven. Well, I tell you, little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. I got another story for you. Jesus is preaching. He's preaching. Thousands of people have gathered to hear him preach. And he, he turns to, to Philip and he says, Philip, everybody's getting hungry. We need to get some food for everybody to eat. Philip says, oh my goodness. Eight months wages wouldn't be enough to buy food for everybody that's here. Andrew says, ta-da, I got something for you. I found a boy with two fish fillet sandwiches. <laughs> All right, so the text says he had five loaves and two small fish. All right. But, but they're like little biscuit size, you know, they're, they're not loaves like we're thinking, you know, you get the super duper long loaf at the store. Uh, no, uh, there's, it's a little boy's lunch. And he says, hey, I, I found a kid here, we're going to take his lunch from him. <laughs> How do you think that kid's feeling? I got this little kid here, he says, and, and, and I actually the text says, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Oh, you know my line here. <laughs> Wait a second. 5,000? That's how many people. That men were there. 5,000 to one. Terrible odds. Very terrible odds. But listen, little is much when God is in it. Jesus blessed that little lunch. And then somehow he multiplied it. I don't know how. He reached in the bag, you know, the McDonald's bag. I don't. I, you know, he reached in, in the basket. I, uh, I don't know how he did that, but he reached in the basket and, and he he loaded up a basket for these guys. That one of the disciples take off the crowd sitting over there because he had them all sit down a little bit more here, and then they went off to another area, and then, and pretty soon every time somebody would reach in and take out, there was more there. Every time reach. In, the text says that everybody ate till they're full. It wasn't just that they would get a bite or a crumb. They were full. And then afterward, they collected all the baskets. And there were 12 baskets full that were left over. Now, that's what I call little as much when God is in it. A little later on, after this had happened, days later, weeks later, I'm not sure, but the, the disciples were kind of complaining about food. And Jesus says, don't you remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets full were gathered up? We know that there was 12 from the other passage. Listen, 5,000 to one is nothing when God is in it. When God is in it. I don't know what makes you feel small? What makes you feel insignificant? What makes you feel like, why try? Here's the deal. When you're at that point, you're probably right where God can use you. Because you're no longer full of yourself. You're empty for God to be in it. To be in it. To be in it. I want you to think of little Bethany. Bethany. I'm not talking about Bethany in the Bible. I'm talking about Bethany the church. We're not a mega church. But I'll tell you what. If you compare percentage-wise of what Bethany does 
percentage-wise to what the megachurch do, we beat them in almost every single category. Little is much when God is in it. But you know what it takes? It's not the building. I got the building up there because you, you identify with Bethany. Little as much when God is in it, I'm talking about you. We are the Lazarus. We are the Martha and Mary. We are Simon. We all are just common, ordinary people living in a common, ordinary, suburban community. <laughs> we are just... We, we are the little ones that God chooses to do great things in when we allow Him to be in it. Perhaps the biggest ministry we have here in our church is outreach to children. The little boy with a little sack lunch who's willing to give it all to Jesus. Everybody thought he was just a little insignificant annoyance. But he was perhaps, he was the most important little thing in that crowd that day. Everybody else was blessed by it. We have a children's ministry and we need helpers in it. We do. We need helpers because we're, we're trying to reach our community. Everybody can do something. Something. In just a couple weeks, we're having a big event. We call it a big event, but it's with little people. <laughs> we're going to have a little Mother's Day gift-making party, and we still need volunteers to help us pull it off, where kids are going to come in on that Saturday before Mother's Day, and they're going to make a gift to give to mom. We just need helpers. It's not really hard. You just supervise, let the kids make a mess making something for mom. And then the moms will see it and say, oh, that's so precious. But you were there to help. You were there to help. It's real simple stuff to do. You know, every week we have uh, kids' life, and uh, we need a teacher, and it's always helpful to have somebody else in the room. Uh, and uh, the little kids, some weeks we're so overrun, and some weeks we're not. You know how it is when the little kids, not every week are they healthy enough to be here without spreading what they got to everybody else, that kind of thing. Little is much when God is in it. We don't know which one of those kids might become the future D.L. Moody, Billy Graham. We don't know. We don't know. It is the biggest ministry we have because little is much when God is in it. It says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Wow. That's why little is much when God is in it. Greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that you did not choose Israel because they were the largest, biggest nation on the earth, but they were the least, and you chose them. You tell us in the New Testament that you chose the, the weak, the simple, not the wise and the strong. You picked us. And you said you're going to be gone for a little while, and while you're gone, we're just supposed to go out and tell people about Jesus. Lord, may we volunteer to help even the least, the least, that they might See the hands and feet of Jesus as we serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.